Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I may be talking through chattering teeth up here. I don't know. Everybody exhale. It's a big warm thoughts. Um, it's kind of cold in here, but we'll be good. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Can. Okay. I, I got one of these, so I wasn't sure. Um, first, I, before I get started with our talk today, which is uh, history, culture, and conflict in the Middle East, uh, and, I, and I'll say in advance, I suggested this yesterday, that today is going to be less um, less a historical uh, study, which is what I've tried to do, although we'll get into some history, as, as, as it is my musings. This is my understanding of what his, where history has brought us, what we find ourselves confronted with today. I don't certainly don't think to have any solutions. If I had solutions to the problems in the Middle East, then I probably wouldn't be on a cruise ship in the, you know, in the Gulf of Aden right now. Um, but we'll we'll get into that. Um, but I wanted to, to. There were two questions I was asked. One yesterday during the session, and then one since then that I, I thought I should should respond to. The question I was asked yesterday, which I did not re answer very well, was given the fact that from the time it, uh, from Muhammad on that the Islamic caliphs, the various of the dynasties and whatnot all were quite aggressive militarily in terms of conquering other lands and things like that, even though they didn't force people to convert to Islam, except in very small, very few cases, they allowed people to keep their own religion. So uh, the, the question was, didn't it look like that they had been just as aggressive from the start as they are now with ISIL and all of that? And I didn't respond very well to that. I think a better answer, as I thought about it, is we need to understand that until the 20th century, that's the way it was done by everybody. The Christian Byzantine Empire, which was a follow-up to the Roman Empire, all of those empires, the Assyrians, two different Babylonian empires, the Hittites, the Egyptians, the Egyptians actually probably less than others because they were pretty secure along, you know, where they were. But it was the way it was done. Up until the 20th century, everybody pursued conquest. When I say up till the 20th century, you'll remember one of the causes of the First World War is that all of the empires that existed at that time all of them wanted to get more property. All of them wanted to have more control over more land. It was the same thing. And so we can't blame Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman, uh, Uthman and Ali and all the rest of them for pursuing conquest because that's what everybody did. Again, up until the 20th century, and I think that the only reason we kind of stopped, kind of, in the 20th century was because of the horror of the First World War the consequences of that sort of land acquisition, imperialistic um, conquest kind of mentality. So again, not to justify any of that, but just to understand we can't point to one group of people at one time in history and say they were bad because all of us come from histories of exactly the same kind of thing. The other question I had was, um, I, what about Baha'ism and Sufism? First, Sufism is actually a sect of Islam. It was on the chart yesterday. Sufism is a mystical brand of uh, Islam. Um, the, the, the Sufis and the, the whirling dervishes, the dervishes, whirling dervishes is sort of a nickname for us, um, that's an aspect, of, one aspect of Sufism. The goal of Sufism is to achieve a mystical union with God. Um, it, it is the mystical branch of Islam in much the same way that Kabbalah is the mystical branch of Judaism. Almost all major religions have had some mystical, you know, there have been Christian mystics as well. Um, and so the, the dervishes, the, pe the, the, worldly, the people who spin, they do so because that motion, they're seeking to get into a mystical trance and in doing so to have more union with God. They are part of Islam. Baha'ism is not seen as part of Islam. They're a separate religion that came out of, the, uh, out of Persia, originally out of, of Islam, but they uh, bought the, a man came along called the Bab, or Gate, who said that he was the forerunner, sort of the John the Baptist, to the, the guy who was to come. And then Baha'u'llah was the one he had announced. He came along, and one of the things he declared was that all religions are correct. Uh, one of the sayings that Baha'i is, all religions are but fingers of the hand of God. I could get into a philosophical explanation for why I don't think that's quite rational. But um, So Baha'ism was thrown out of Persia. They went to England. They got thrown out of England, and they ended up the center for global Baha'ism right now, although they, they have these extraordinary buildings. The Baha'i temples are some of the most extraordinary buildings in the world. Their center right now is in Haifa, in Israel. 
if you go to Haifa, they have these ex up up the mountain there, up the hill from the uh, above the harbor. They have these beautiful gardens, and that's the global center of, above, for Baha'i. They are now seen as a separate religion. They are not accepted, uh, even though they started in Islam. They are not part of Islam anymore. So that was another question I had. Okay. I kept promising I will put this up here. Um, if you don't have anything to write on, you want to talk to me later, uh, just grab me on the boat. I will give you this information. Uh, this is the website where the videos, both uh, the talks I've done and the ones that Emily has done, we will put the videos up for you. Um, and as I said before, when you go on that LIT Chapala, which is Lakeside Institute of Theology um, website, there's a bar across it. You will see Windstar Talks right there on the first page. Click Windstar Talks, and then you have the options of either Wonders of Arabia or the talks I did last year on Footsteps of Faith. Okay. This is my last scheduled talk. I will be around to answer questions and everything else, but History, Culture, and Conflict in the Middle East is my last talk this afternoon. Emily will be doing Ancient Arabia, and then I think she's got a couple of other talks, and then we're going to try to intersperse some movies. I don't know exactly where we ended up with that. Of course, tomorrow we land in Oman. Then we have two more days uh, on the water, and then a second visit to Oman, and the next day is when we arrive in Dubai. So we've only got two days after today that we have sea days. All right. Well, as we get into this, I mentioned yesterday that most Westerners think of Islam as being in primitive countries, and in fact, as being a primitive religion. In fact, for centuries, at least from the 9th to the 12th century, and many people say from the 8th to the 13th century, Islam was the center of every kind of advanced civilization and culture that existed. The golden age of Islam, they made huge advances in science, in medicine, philosophy, um, literature. In fact, this was the first time in history when somebody could make a living by writing and selling books. They, from China, they had learned how to make paper, which was much easier to make and faster to make uh, than uh, parchment, lasted longer than, than papyrus. Um, paper making, especially linen-based paper making, came from the Islamic countries to the west. It started there. They, uh, advances in mathematics, I mentioned yesterday, try writing down five Roman numerals and adding them up. We use Arabic numerals today because of the advances. They not only had mathematics, arithmetic, that rather that they didn't have in the West, but they developed ca calculus as well, much in advance of us. They developed um, astronomy. They identified the Andromeda galaxy first before any, before Galileo or any of the rest of that. They were doing astronomy, zoology, chemistry, um, geology, geography, cartography, map making. They excelled in all of those things. In medicine, I mentioned yesterday that between the 9th century and the 16th century, they had no need of any input on medical things from the West because they, they were so far advanced. The first time they had to translate something in medicine from the West is because syphilis had been introduced from the West and they didn't know how to treat it, so they trans. It came from, they called it the Frankish disease. The French had introduced it, and so they translated a medical document to see how to treat the venereal disease. But in virtually every way imaginable, they were the high point of culture. Um, the first scientist, the man who's been by modern scientists, called the first true scientist who really developed the experimental process, um, Probably the first university in the world, certainly certainly the first degree-granting university in the world, was in the Islamic East. Um, now, so what happened? Oh, I, I guess I should say, too, that in terms of art and architecture, if you have been to um, Istanbul, if you have been to Baghdad, Cairo, etc., you can see some examples of that. They excelled in ceramics, in glasswork, metalwork, textiles, woodwork, um, illuminated manuscripts. The architectural developments from the Islamic world were extraordinary and still are extraordinary. They, um, they built bridges like no bridges that had ever been built before. They were just, a, 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 we cannot overstate how advanced the Islamic culture was at that time. So what happened? That's always been the big question. What happened? The, initially, the Golden Age of Islam ended when the Mongols invaded. There was the sack of Baghdad in the 13th century. Also, a little bit before that, uh, or around the same time, we had the Reconquista, where the forces of Europe pushed the uh, Islamic 
Caliphate of Cordoba out of the Iberian Peninsula, and that was the point at which we regained so much of the knowledge that we had lost. For instance, the West had completely lost all of the Greek philosophers. We didn't have Plato, we didn't have Aristotle, we didn't have any of that. But in the Golden Age, especially the House of Wisdom, which was sort of a university and library and place of learning and growth, they were seeking to gather all the knowledge in the whole world to gather it, translate it into Arabic, and keep it. Well, when the Islamic forces or the Islamic culture was driven out of the Iberian Peninsula and the European forces came in and took over again, they found all these libraries. That's when we were introduced to numbers. You want to know how primitive our math was? We did not in the West have a concept of zero until we got the libraries and the documents back from the Islamic culture that had been in the Iberian Peninsula. Imagine trying to do mathematics without a concept of zero. I remember when I was a little kid watching one of these, you know, you are there kind of shows, you know, on Saturday morning. Remember those? And they were talking about, um, it was a monk trying to explain to another Western European what a zero was, because they had found it in the libraries and stuff, in the mathematics, and he was trying to explain it, and I can remember they said, well, what, what does it mean? He goes, well, it's nothing. And he goes, then why do you need it? <laughs> well, try to do anything in mathematics without a zero, all right? That gives you an idea how far behind the West was. Then later in the 17th century, so 13th century, uh, the, the sack of Baghdad by the Mongols, and for a long time, the people in the Islamic world tried to blame the Mongols. But then everybody said, well, why were we in such bad shape that the Mongols were able to do that? So they stopped blaming them. The Reconquista occurred in the 17th century when Islam had, the Ottoman Empire had moved all the way to the gates of Vienna. The Holy League in Europe, a number of European powers got together, pushed them all out. Then later on, the 19th century, the rest of Eastern Europe managed to push the Ottoman troops out. This was when the Ottoman Empire became known as the sick old man of Europe because the Serbians threw them out, the Bulgarians threw them out, Greece threw them out, and so they lost all of their foothold other than a really tiny bit where Constantinople is in Europe. In the early 20th century, obviously, the Ottoman Empire, the last of the caliphates, lost. They were on the wrong side in the First World War, and the last of the caliphs, uh, the caliphate was ended by Ataturk in Turkey in 1924 meaning they did not have one religious leader over the Islamic world anymore, anymore. And the fact is, from that, the Islamic world today is behind the West in almost any way you want to imagine, technologically, um, educationally. And so the question is always asked, especially by people who are in the Islamic world, what happened? What went wrong? And in many cases, that question has turned into who did this to us? Now much, I believe, of what happened that caused the Islamic world to lose their preeminence in culture, science, mathematics, and everything else has to do with the thing that has caused the cause of the fall of so many empires, and that was hubris. Pride. The, in the Islamic world, at one time, they were so far advanced that they didn't think there was anything to be learned or gained from relationships with the West. For instance, all of the Western powers, who were behind in a lot of ways, they sent delegations that lived permanently in the Islamic world to find out what's going on, learn what they could, send stuff back. The Islamic world did not do that for two reasons. One, they didn't think there was anything to be gained by it, and secondly, they, they felt like we don't want to associate with those, you know, those primitive, uncivilized infidels any more than we have to. So, for instance, they didn't even have any political delegations that were permanent in, in the West. If the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, for instance, wanted to communicate something to one of the powers in the, in the West, he would send a delegation to deliver the message, and then they'd come back. There was no permanent relationship going in that direction. And to give you some idea how advanced they were, uh, the, the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire at one point sent a letter to Queen Victoria identifying her as his vassal, and that England only existed because he allowed it to. And Victoria did not disagree. The fact was that, and if you, if you know anything about the history, the Battle of Lepanto, which was a, a sea battle, was the first time that the Islamic forces were really defeated by the West, and the West celebrates that to this day. I mean, there are epic poems about it. One of my heroes is G.K. Chesterton. Chesterton wrote a poem called Lepanto. It's a long, epic poem about this victory. Well, it was a big deal to the West, but in the East, it was 
they hardly noticed it. In fact, the Sultan, after the fleet was destroyed in Lepanto, he asked his ministers, one of his ministers, is there any problem with us replacing the fleet? And the minister said, oh great Sultan, if you wish, we can, we can have another fleet immediately and we can have golden anchors, silken sails, and uh, linen ropes. We are so wealthy and so powerful, this is not even a blink to them. And yet the West celebrated it because it was the first time they had had any military success up to that point against Islam. Now, so the question, how did this happen? How is it that Islam fell so far? So that today, they clearly, and I, nobody can disagree with this, they are behind in technology and education and most other measurements. Some groups in Islam blamed secularization. That means we have left the faith. You remember, this is similar to what the Byzantines went through. You remember Emily commented on the fact that the two iconic classic periods in the Byzantine Empire at the ninth century, it's because they were being defeated by the armies of Islam. And they started looking around saying, what are we doing wrong? And some of the people said, well, God is unhappy with us because we, are, we have these icons, and we are focusing on these icons, and perhaps they're graven images. And so they tried destroying them, thinking that way God wouldn't be upset with them, and they'd start winning. Well, Islam has gone through much the same sort of thing, thinking we have allowed ourselves to be too secularized, and we need to return to a more fundamentalist kind of approach to the faith. This was the root of the Iranian Revolution, the Ayatollah Khomeini returning to Iran. The idea is, the reason we've got all these problems is because we have become secularized, we need to return to a much more rigid uh, approach to the faith. And we begin to see that kind of in a, a number of ways. Flip the coin, and there were others in the Islamic world that said the problem is that we've been too fundamentalist, and we need to allow ourselves to understand and accept the westernization, not cut ourselves off from it, and the, the best example of that is Turkey. When um, Mustafa Kemal, who became known as Ataturk, it's a nickname, an honorary nickname, when Ataturk became the president and declared the Republic of Turkey in the 1920s, he changed from Arabic to a Western alphabet. He changed the way people dressed. You were not allowed to wear traditional dress. Um, he tried to develop relationships with the West. He suppressed fundamentalism. Now, Turkey is still 97 or 98% Islamic, but it is a secular state. One of the things that he insisted on is a separation of church and state. Sound familiar? A lot of people have said, because of the fact that in Islam, in many cases, Iran being a recent example, there still was a sense in which the religious authority, this is what Islamism is all about, the idea that politics of a place and country need to be controlled by the religion as well, need to be controlled by Islam. Ataturk said no, and Turkey thrived. A lot of people have looked at it and said, that's our problem. We need to separate church and state the way the West has and allow the culture to develop science, everything else, without the restrictions. It is a fact that in some places, where very conservative Islamic clerics have been in charge, they have insisted that the focus of education needs to be the Quran, and entirely the Quran. There was very little room for other kind of education, and they've ended up with, you know, a, a limited education, uh, edu a, a population that has limited education on a broader scale, that have memorized the Quran, but don't have a lot of the other things. It's also true of very conservative interpretations of Islam, women have not been seen as being people to be educated and um, allowed to thrive, and so half the population has not been productive in many places. Now again, I'm making generalizations here, and you need to realize that there are radical differences between Iran and Turkey, you know, between Saudi Arabia and, and some, you know, Syria or whatever. And so, um, but still, on the whole, if you think of Islam as a, um, a cultural region, then I, I believe that's been very much the case. Um, as we look at more modern times, I think that's sort of a historical background. And there are people, still today, who hold it against the West as though we did something to them, especially because of the decisions of the, the empires leading up to the First World War, what caused the First World War, the breaking up of the Ottoman Empire after that. Now, I've already talked to you about in the, the discussion about Lawrence of Arabia, that prior to, or in the First World War, promises were made by Great Britain and the other allied powers through Great Britain to 
Hussein bin Ali, Hussein bin Ali who was the, um, the Sharif of Mecca and Medina, of the holy sites, he became the king of the Hejaz. They promised him that if you will get, if you will work as the one leader that the Arab tribes might listen to, because he was over the holy sites that all of the tribes, the Islamic Arabic tribes, uh, <coughs> look to, if you will get them to fight on the side of the Allied forces for the British, we will guarantee you an Arab homeland. This was what he was promised, and there are very specific descriptions. Again, I talked about this the other day. But what happened was they went back on their word because at the same time those promises were being made, the British and the French, with the support of the Russians, the other ally in this process, had agreed in the Sykes-Picot Agreement, formerly known as the Asia Minor Agreement, that when the war was over, assuming that they did succeed in, in uh, taking over the Ottoman Empire, that Britain and France would split up the Middle East according to their own interests. And again, this is what was promised. This is what they ended up with. Syria and Lebanon were controlled by the French, and you will remember that Faisal, the third son of King Hussein of the Hejaz, was made king of Syria and was only in power for about four months, and the French marched in with their army and defeated the, the Syrian army and threw him out. Actually, he left before they got there. He tried to do it peacefully. Later on, he was elected, um, that he was made king of the Iraq by the British because they recognized that that would be a more peaceful way to do it. He was under their mandate for a time. Now, this was all done. The British, the British got Iraq, Transjordan, which later became known as the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, and Palestine. The French got Lebanon and Syria after having promised that the Arabs would have self-determination. Well, that, that issue of the League of Nations, the, the Paris Peace uh, Peace Treaty, or the, the Paris Peace Conference, and later the San Remo Conference, a conference in Italy that divided all this up, the League of Nations supported their decision. The League of Nations was a brand new organization that was created at the end of the First World War. It was the predecessor to the United Nations. The United States, Woodrow Wilson was the one primarily who came up with the idea of the League of Nations, and then once they created it, the U.S. Congress would not let America, the United States join the League of Nations. <laughs> And so the League of Nations ended up eventually dying out. The United Nations superseded it. But this whole Sykes-Picot Agreement, um, the division of the territory afterwards, which the League of Nations supported. Now, why did it do that? Um, I need somebody to go back and fix that back there, if you would. And the Balfour Declaration, the Balfour Declaration, which said, again, without consulting the Arab peoples who were promised the land, the Balfour Declaration came out saying that the government of, the, of Great Britain would support the establishment of a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Now, one of the com most common errors people have, and I have heard this said several times in conversations and in classes and whatnot, is that the Jews and the Arabs have always hated each other. Thank you very much. Let's give a hand to Emily. Emily. Thank you, Emily. I don't, I don't know even how to do that on here, but I did. Um, the response of King Faisal to the, dec to the Balfour Declaration was that we will welcome the Jewish people. His son, Faisal, who was for four months the king of Syria and later the king of Iraq, this is what Faisal said at the idea of the Jews coming to the Palestine. He said, we Arabs look with the deepest sympathy on the Zionist movement. Our deputation here in Paris, this was issued during the Paris Peace Conference, is fully acquainted with the proposals submitted yesterday by the Zionist organization to the Peace Conference, and we regard them as moderate and proper. We will do our best insofar as we are concerned to help them through. We will wish the Jews a most hearty welcome home. I look forward, and my people with me look forward, to a future in which we will help you, and you will help us, so that the countries in which we are mutually interested may once again take their places in the community of the civilized peoples of the world. Now, this he was not a nobody. Faisal, again, was made king, was well enough thought of that he was made king of Syria until the French threw him out, and then the king of Jordan. His family, his, his older brother, Abdullah, became first the emir and then the first king of Jordan. And so, we're talking about the leaders of the Arab world here, and this was their response. They were willing to welcome 
the Jewish people to work together in having one homeland. Now this, of course, was in the 1920s. The idea of the Western powers making the decisions, just like the imperial powers had done in the 19th century and earlier, them making the decisions how they were going to divide up the Middle East still rankles people. I've got, I've got a picture here on this. This one. This is the president of Turkey, the current president of Turkey, Recep Tayyip uh, Erdogan. This was from a month ago. He did a uh, speech at university in Turkey, which was broadcast, in which he declared that Lawrence of Arabia was a bigger enemy to the Arab peoples than ISIS because, and his history is really bad here, because Lawrence of Arabia opposed the Sykes-Picot Agreement and refused a knighthood because the British did not keep their, their promise to the Arab people. But um, Erdogan specifically pointed to the Sykes-Picot Agreement as being the source of many of the problems. And he, he went so far as to say, the difficulties that we are having now with ISIS and all the rest of this fundamentalist problem is because of the Sykes-Picot Agreement, because of the, the dishonesty of the British and French and the fact that they could presume to carve up land that had been promised to the Arabs for their own sake, just because they wanted to and could, because they had the armies. ISIS, or ISIL is a better name for them, they, you may know that one of the things they've done that's quite new and extraordinary is they have used the social media very effectively. They do videos on YouTube, they do use Twitter, and all kinds of things. Well, they've done a video called The End of sykes picot And in it, they feature the blowing up of a, a border guard post of one of the borders that was established under sykes picot And they're talking all the time. I, I saw part of that video. I can only take part of it. Um, and they talk about the fact that sykes picot is the great evil, we're doing away with that, all of the borders that they declared are going to be gone. Now not only was that seen as being a, an imperialistic kind of approach by the West in violation of their promises, and still frustrating, but the actual lines that they drew ended up themselves creating horrible problems. The French and the British did not think about what the local people who lived in the Middle East how they would react to this. They just cut it up the way they wanted to, and how, what, however they agreed. An example of that would be that the nation of Iraq ended up being split. There are three very distinct parts of the country of Iraq now. In the south, it is predominantly Shia Islam. And remember, Shia and Sunni don't get along very well. The center part of the country, and the part that controls, even though it's not the majority, are the Sunnis. In the north, you have the Kurds. So this country was created with three very different ethnic and religious groups, bless you, um, that have continued to have problems. You remember Saddam Hussein running the country of Iraq, gassing the Kurds? There have been conflicts because the, the people in this part of the world, their focus is much more on tribal affiliations and uh, ethnic affiliations and cultural affiliations. And everybody says, oh, well, you know, they're all the same. They are not. The Kurds are a different ethnic group. The Iranians are Persian. They're not Arabs. Folks, people make that mistake. The Iranians are, are Persian. The Iraqis are predominantly Arab and Kurdish. Um, Turkey is a completely different ethnic background. Egypt is a different ethnic background. It's not all one thing. And yet the West came in and drew these lines, and they cut across and forced people together that have continued to have problems. And so, again, this approach has created an enormous difficulty. And when the French and British mandates were put into place and those lines were drawn, they all hoped that the U.S., which was the one power that really did not end up being broken by the First World War, even Britain and France, the two that, that remained of the six empires, they were much weakened. They kept hoping the U.S. would step in and make sure that justice was done. But after the war, Woodrow Wilson retreated again. I'm not blaming him, but he went back to the policy he had previously, which is we don't mess in other people's affairs, and sort of retreated to the Marshall Plan kind of idea. Um, but for that reason, some people felt the U.S. was a party to all of this, even though the U.S. did not take any of the property or any of the territory in the Middle East. Um, 
The problem with the Jewish and Arabic conflict, again, it is not accurate to say that the Jews and Arabs have always hated each other. You just read the quote from King Faisal. This is the map of Israel on the left. And you will notice on that map, this yellow area is the West Bank, or the Palestinian territory of the West Bank. This little strip here is the Gaza Strip of the Palestinian territories. Now technically those two are supposed to be one Palestinian territory. But the West Bank is controlled by Fatah, um, the, which is the descendant of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, you know, Arafat. Gaza is primarily controlled by Hamas. They don't get along. They don't really relate to one another. And even if they did, there's no real way for them to communicate. There's no road. There's no bridge. There's no tunnel connecting these two areas. They're very different, very much separated. Well, what happened when the Jewish nation was declared the Jews, after the Second World War especially, began uh, immigrating back to Palestine. The Balfour Declaration had said that Britain, who was in charge of this area under the British mandate, that they would allow and encourage that, even though they hadn't said yet how they were going to do it. The United Nations, again, the successor organization to the League of Nations, and you remember what the Arabs thought about the League of Nations, because they confirmed what they thought was a dishonesty. <coughs> The United Nations declared in 1948 that Palestine would be divided into two nations, a Jewish nation, an Arab nation, and that the city of Jerusalem would be an independent international city that everybody had access to. Well, the Jews who were in Palestine at that point celebrated that greatly. The Arabic peoples said, here they go again. The League of Nations took our land from us after having lied to us the British having lied to us in the First World War. Now the successor organization to the League of Nations, the United Nations, has made a decision to divide up our land. And so the Arabs rebelled against that, not so much because they had a problem with the Jews. The Jews and the Arabs had gotten along for millennia. They had a problem with it because the Western powers were telling them what was going to happen to their land. What happened was five Arab nations, six if you count the very few soldiers that Lebanon contributed, five Arabic nations said, we're not going to let this stand, and they went, They declared war against the, the, the half million Jews who, were, who had just been declared, you know, they declared their independence uh, as a nation in 1948. The first country to recognize that was who? The United States. The United States. U.S. was the first country to recognize the state of Israel. Which again, uh, we ended up being blamed for this, they felt like imperialistic move, the Arab people felt like an imperialistic move to divide up their land again. Well, the Arab nations told the Palestinian, the Arab peoples who, had been, who were living here and had been living here for thousands of years, okay, you need to leave just until this is over. We expect it will only be a week or two that we will defeat these, you know, we'll, we'll defeat the half million Jewish people who are there in this war and then you'll be able to come back home and we'll, this will all be settled. And so this is the reason we have Palestinian refugees. Even though Palestinians and Jews were living right next to each other, and in many cases when this all started, Jewish families defended their Palestinian neighbors. There was not, there, there were Jews living there and had been living there for a long time. There were a lot more who had come in recently. They got along just fine, thank you. Well, the Palestinians left, many of them, not all of them, but many of them left thinking, They've been promised you'll be able to come back in a, in a few weeks. Well, the five Arab, Arab nations were defeated by Israel, by the half million Jewish people who had settled there, much to everyone's shock. And the Jews have continued to effectively defend themselves ever since then, even though they are outnumbered, frequently outgunned. Um, it is true that here's an example of the development of the West versus the Arabic and Islamic world. During the wars, the Israeli pilots, who most of whom were very Western in their training and in their orientation, were like 10 to 1 more effective than the Arabic pilots from the Arab countries. Um, and so that's why the Israeli Air Force, simply because their pilots were so much better, they had been, they'd grown up with technology much more so, they were comfortable with it, they were much more effective. So this war happens, and as if it wasn't bad enough that the Arab peoples felt like they had been controlled and pushed around by Western empires, now a half a million Jews who just got here, most of them, 
have defeated us. And that was almost more than they could take. My sense in reading the history is that the original problem was not that the Arabs had a problem with the Jews, they had a problem with the Western powers that put the Jews there and then twice decided that they were going to carve up the Middle East. And yet, of course, the British weren't really there to focus on. Now, when they were there, they had a terrible time. Emily was just talking about the fact that after the First World War, for instance, um, there, was, there was a lot of upset. There was a lot of violence. There was a lot of rebellion that was going on. Well, the same thing happened later, and the British were often targets of that. They got out of there as quick as they could. And so, who was left to, to point at, to yell at, to be angry at, to rebel against, but the Jews? And it almost ended up being, you know, a transferal of frustration to a people that the Arabs had not historically had a problem with. I think that's much uh, of it. Now, today, the problem that we have is that there are two fundamentally incompatible objectives. It's actually just one problem that, that's, uh, I'm, I'm way oversimplifying, obviously there are always a million problems. But there is one fundamental problem, and that is the Jewish people have been oppressed and persecuted almost to the point of annihilation throughout their whole history. Go back and read the book of Esther. That's the first time a government decided, uh, or, yeah, a government decided there was going to be a systematic annihilation of the Jewish people. The Russian pogroms, obviously the Holocaust. The Jewish people have been the most persecuted people in history. And so the whole point of having a Jewish homeland in Palestine, their original homes, was that they would no longer be victims of oppression by others. And that's the reason why they, the, uh, the Israelis today are so adamant about defending themselves and not negotiating with terrorists and not allowing any kind of oppression. The idea of a Jewish homeland is to keep them from ever again having to suffer what they suffered before. The Palestinians, on the other hand, they want their homes back. They want their land back. Land that they had had, again, some of them for millennia living in this part of the world. The problem we have, see, we as Westerners, as Americans, Canadians, British, we believe in one person, one vote. We believe in the right of self-determination. The problem is that just in the last year or so, there are more Jews living in Israel than live outside Israel, but there's only 14 million Jews total, which means there's just a little over 7 million Jews living in the nation of Israel. There are 4.5 million Palestinians living in the Palestinian territories. There's another million Arabic, um, Arabic Middle Eastern, or Arabic Israelis actually living in Israel. But there's almost an equal number to that in Jordan and in the surrounding areas that left. If Israel were to give the Arabic Palestinians the right to vote, in other words, if it was an equal dem democratic kind of situation, then the Jewish people would no longer have the majority vote. They would be outvoted. And the fear is that they no longer would have a Jewish homeland if they give the right of vote to all of those people. And we can be sympathetic to their, their concerns in that regard. But at the same time, we believe in one person, one vote. We believe in fair representation. I mean, the reason that the Americans fought the Revolutionary War is taxation without representation was not acceptable to us. We should have a right to determine ourselves. The Palestinians can't be given that by the Israelis because if they do, then they fear that the Jewish homeland will no longer exist. That's the fundamental incompatibility that exists here. And as a result of that, Israel, and again, I'm very sympathetic to this, Israel has done things which, if they're thought of in terms of Israel's effort to try to maintain themselves as a nation, we can say we understand, but if we look at them as individual acts, they would not be considered acceptable in the West. The fact they don't give vote to people who have always lived there, the fact that they took land and they have passed laws to officially, you know, they said many of the Palestinians have been refugees for 65 years. And people, I've had people say to me when I've talked about this before, well, but you know, the, the, the people of Israel, the Hebrew people were given that land by God and you know, and so it's theirs, it was theirs first. Well, I say, well, think about this, where you live in the US, if a Native American were to show up at your door and knock on your door and say, before you ever showed up here, this was my land and I expect you to leave, what would you do? What would you say? Because they were there first, you've been there for generations, you know, 
hundreds and hundreds of years your family has now been on this land and you own it, you paid for it, you built it up, somebody comes along and says it used to be mine so I want it back? That is not an easy thing to, you know, we can't say that. You can understand the frustration and concern that the Palestinians have, as much sympathy as we can have for the Jewish people. It's also true, for instance, in the, in the West Bank area, you know about the wall. Because they were having uh, terrorist attacks from the Palestinian territories into the um, Israeli territories, they have built a wall, which in some places as much as 26 feet high, barbed wire, the whole thing. They have split villages, they have cut family members off from each other, they have cut people off from the land that they own, that they can't farm anymore. In some cases they've cut them off from the source of water. And again, understanding the fear of terrorist attacks, still, if there was a neighborhood in New York that there were a lot of criminal activities coming out of there, would we build a wall around it and say nobody can go in or out anymore? I heard one speaker say in, in Ireland, during the troubles in Ireland, if the British had built a wall around the city of Belfast, again, there are some people who are, have done and want to do terrible things, but do you punish the whole population for that, for what might happen next? That's not the legal system that we're used to. And so, when you think about it in those terms, in any other circumstance in the world, we would think that that's completely wrong. And yet it has been done, and most of the Western world turns a blind eye. And again, many of the Arab peoples, and there are a lot of Arab peoples who simply say, I just want to be able to access my land to farm. I want to be able to, you know, there are husbands and wives, because they have different ethnic backgrounds, who no longer can live in the same place. They're only allowed to visit each other once in a while. It is a very complicated situation. There is no single, simple answer. I think that we need to have sympathy for both sides, but it fundamentally boils down to, and, and uh, Netanyahu, once used an expression, he said that Israel was facing a demographic bomb. What that meant was, even though there continues to be immigration of Jews to, by the, by the law of return, to Israel, the birth rate amongst Israeli Jews is so much lower than the Palestinians that the Palestinians continue to increase at a faster rate. The demographic bomb meant that this issue of not being able to give equality to the Palestinians because they, they would have majority vote, it's getting worse, not better. And they recognize that. It, there is no simple solution to that, but hopefully, you know, you now understand what the problem is there. Um, to my mind, and this is way oversimplistic, I think the issue is people always talk about finding a solution. I don't think they need to find a solution. I think they need to find a process. If the nation of Israel could begin to give more representation with limits to the Palestinians so they felt like they had some aspect of self-determination. Right now, the Knesset, which is the Israeli parliament, only 10% are uh, of, of Arabic, but they're only they're Arab Israeli citizens, not, the Palestin not from the Palestinian territories. If they could find some way to start giving some voice, some vote, some self-determination to the Palestinians, but limit it and say, okay, you can't have enough that you become the majority, and develop it over time and begin a process, maybe that would take them in the right direction. This, by the way, is exactly the problem that white South Africa had. They felt like if they gave equal vote and freedom to black South Africans, that the white South Africans would be killed, thrown out of the country, disavowed. We actually do have, you know, the, the situation in, um, Zimbabwe, where to a great extent that happened. You know, the white settlers in Zimbabwe have been dispossessed by the black population. And so, you know, we have a we have an example where it turned out well, an example where it didn't turn out well, once once the majority population was given equality with the minorities uh, that was in control. So there's no easy answer to this. But hopefully you get a sense where the historic frustrations come from what the current issues and concerns are, and pray for Israel and pray for the Palestinians. Thank you very much. Any questions? Yes? What I'm saying, you know, we have the same issue with the people crossing the border. What's that? We have the same issue with the people crossing the border. Mexico come into our country. Um, yeah, the issue of, uh, he said, don't we have the same problem with people coming into the United States from Mexico? Well, I live in Mexico, so I maybe have a different perspective on that. The fact is that every study that's been done says 
that were it not for Mexican immigrants doing the labor, the U.S. economy could not survive. Oh, yes. I, I love that. I live in Texas. I yeah, know. there you go. But <laughs> the trouble is, is people are afraid. They're, they're afraid. afraid. Because they're afraid of the water down our culture. Yeah, two, two of the things that I, I don't think people realize is that for the last two years, there have been more Mexicans going back to Mexico than coming across. Yeah. And secondly, all the studies that have been then say that by the year uh, 2020, just six years from now, the United States is going to be paying Mexicans to come to the U.S. because of the fact that we're not getting that flow. We're going to be paying for Mexicans to come do the labor, you know, to pick the fruit and do all the things that we're not willing to do anymore. Okay, that's a completely different subject. But uh, because I live in Mexico, of course, I have feelings about that. Uh, questions? So you've now got it all figured out. Yes, Bob. Uh, Egypt and Syria, you say? Yeah. Could you repeat the question? Well, under Nasser. Well, the idea, there's always been an effort yeah. to create a pan-Islamic presence. In fact, a number of organizations have been created to try to pursue that, you know. Um, the And then we've had various agreements, various contracts, various treaties, and they never last. You know, there has never been a successful effort to create any sort of pan-Islamic or pan-Arabic. Both of those have been attempts. Pan-Arabic or Pan-Islamic. There are simply too many differences. You start getting into Pan-Islamic efforts and you immediately run into the difference between Shuni, uh, Sunni and Shia and all the other things. When you start talking about Pan-Arabic, that immediately starts running the confrontations with nationalistic movements. Like the Arab Spring was not so much the Arab people agreeing they were going to rise up, they were nationalistic movements within the individual countries that sort of fed on each other. Okay, And so Pro-nationalism gets in the way of pro-Arab Arab movements. The uh, differences in is different kinds of Islam prevent a uh, pan-Islamic kind of movement. And so, yes, there have been various times in which they, they made that effort. Nasser, for instance, and others, their real objective is to try to generate a unity amongst those powers. Nobody's ever been able to really do it yet. Another question? Yes. On a related note, um, at the end of the Lawrence of Arabia movie last week, right. they tried to set up an Arab council and fell apart because right. the arguments between the tribes. Do you think the same thing might happen with ISIL if they tried to set up a government organization? Uh, well, the question was, at the end of the, um, or toward the end of the Lawrence of Arabia movie, they have the scene in Damascus where they try to set up a, you know, a pro-Arab council to run Damascus. Um, and would the same thing happen if ISIL tried to set something up? Um, I don't want to draw any comparisons between the, the Arabs that were in Damascus and ISIL because you know they, they were under King Faisal, they were with, you know, Lawrence was involved in that. I also want to make sure you understand that's not an accurate presentation of what happened. Yes, they were struggling to try to sort out some of the problems, but this idea that they were all asking acting like you know college sophomores and smacking each other upside the head and not being able to even talk to each other, I don't believe that's accurate. I mean they did end up later on electing Faisal as the king of Syria. You know, they did move forward on this, and then the French interceded. Um, whether or not ISIL, um, the bottom line is, the issue with ISIL and with organizations like ISIL, it's not because they're Islamic. It's not because they're any one thing other than that they're bullies. Hmm. They want what they want, and they find excuses to justify it. Self-justification is a powerful motivator. We always want to get what we want, and we want to find ways to justify it. And several times now, ISIL being one, they try to justify it under religious terms. But in fact, they're just evil. I mean, it just—it really does boil down to that. It has nothing to do, I don't think, with religious issues. They just use that as an excuse. Yes? Since we started this trip in Athens, right? um, Sweden announced that they are now going to vote for a Palestinian state. Okay. They arrived in Jordan after coming back from Petra. Jordan recalled his ambassador from Israel. The Israeli ambassador to Jordan has now said that the peace treaty is almost a worthless piece of paper. Right. We leave Petra and we go to Egypt. Uh, now we have the, I don't think it's the Muslim Brotherhood, but it's an offshoot of them, have now pledged allegiance to ISIS as we go through this. The Economic Union is now trying to have a vote as a union to recognize Palestine. Right. So, and the violence in Israel, they say, is the worst that it's ever been. 
Yeah, and the violence is between is entirely between the Strip of Gaza and and Israel. Um, he just I won't get into all that, but it's I haven't even been up on the news very well. But a number of different developments have occurred even while we've been on this trip, having to do with ISIL. Now, if the if an offshoot of the, of the um, Muslim Brotherhood in in Egypt has pledged their support to ISIL, that's the only organization that I'm aware of anywhere that has said they would support them. Every other Islamic country, every other Islamic leader has has at least verbally, um, you know, blasted them and said, we don't support them. Now, whether or not they're able or willing to provide military support, I don't know. Uh, somebody just mentioned that the uh, to me this morning that the Iranian religious leader has just made a declaration against Israel as well. Again, it's... If we stayed at sea for four more days, who knows what would happen? Um, <laughs> This is, the, this is the state of things. There is no simple answer, and there are people always choosing sides. Historically, the West has, 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 for the most part, supported Israel in all circumstances. But we now, there has been an increased sense that some of the things that Israel has done, like the wall, have not been justified, have not been just, and so therefore you get more and more people beginning to say, no, we, don't, we can't support that anymore. Now again, I don't think there's an easy answer either way. Um, I'm very sympathetic to the situation of the Jewish people and their need to have a secure state that they can, they do not feel as though they're gonna be threatened in. At the same time, most of the Palestinians are, are simply caught in the middle of this thing. They're not at fault. You know, I, I, I would not wanna be, you know, if I were living back in, in Seattle, I wouldn't wanna be put in, put in a large prison because somebody else in my neighborhood had Thoughts of doing something violent, you know, it is, it's very, very hard. Uh, here first, yes. I, I think you also can't underplay the fact that it's like an economic differential between how you know, Jewish Israelis live and Palestinian Israelis live. Because the Palestinian Israelis are the Jewish Israelis. That's very true. There, there's a huge economic difference. Um, in terms of, for instance, in Gaza, uh, the average income is less than a dollar a day. All right. Israel is, is to the great extent, a very westernized country, very well educated, high literacy rates. Um, there are huge economic differences there. And again, this is one of the reasons why people feel that, you know, as long as that's the situation in Gaza, and to a lesser extent, but still not good in the West Bank, amongst the Palestinians who are there, then shouldn't we ought to be doing something about that? And yet, we don't seem to be able to find a way to do it. And I, so I'm not proposing a solution. I'm just identifying here's what some of the problems are. Uh, back here first, yes. I'm sorry, how many Palestinians, what? I'm sorry. Um, how many Palestinians are actually in refugee camps? I don't have a number. I know that in the, um, in the Palestinian territories, which most of those people are displaced. There are just over, uh, there are four and a half million people, okay, Palestinians living in the Palestinian territories, that's the West Bank and Gaza. How many of those are living in what would be considered a refugee camp? I don't have a number, sorry. Um, but I have read that the situation is getting consistently worse rather than better, and that, that that leads to some of the things like less than a dollar income a day. You know, that access to resources, um, materials, even food, is very limited in many cases. You know, it is a very bad situation. Um, yes. Oh, you, you scratch your nose, and I'll call on you. <laughs> Another question. Yes. What about the last days and the, what does God say about it? The last days, about the last days and what God says about it. Um, <laughs> obviously, there's a lot of difference on that. I don't think I can get into it. The um, in the U.S., there are there's a movement called um, Zionist Christians who believe that no matter what Israel does or says, that we have to support them because the biblical mandate, you know, to pray for Jerusalem, to, you know, that Israel is, you know, is, that, that 1948 was a fulfillment of the promise that God had given that the Israelites would return to the promised land. Um, uh, you know, as, a, as an evangelical Christian, I, you know, I have beliefs in those directions, but not as Christian Zionists, I'm not. The problem is, at no time in the, in the history of Israel in the ancient times, in the Hebrew Bible, did God say it was okay for the Israelites to do whatever they wanted to do. In fact, God judged them and condemned them and, and corrected them. 
when they did injustice. And the two big things that God judged the Israelites for, and in fact, why they ended up going into exile was one, because of worshiping other gods, but secondly, because of not caring for the needs of the widows and the orphans. Those are the two things. <laughs> well, looking at the situation in Palestine right now, looking at the Palestinian territories, clearly there are widows and orphans who are not being cared for. And the government of Israel feels they're doing that as, as an act of self-defense. I, I do not think that everything that Israel does, no matter where I'm coming from, from a faith perspective, um, I cannot say anything that Israel or any other geopolitical entity does is inherently right. It has to be right just because they do it. 67% of the people in Israel consider themselves secular. It's not like this is, you know, this is the Hebrew nation under, you know, under Moses or Joshua or whatever. It's a very different kind of situation. So I don't think we can, we can, no matter where you come from, from a faith perspective, we can't paint it with that brush. Other questions or comments? Thank you. Oh, one more. The last one. Uh, you were talking about the more fundamentalist uh, set of offshoots of the Islam. Right. And in putting that in perspective with what's happening today, do you think they would be content to stop in the Middle East, or do you think their long-term uh, goals are expansion? Um, the question is that given the militant Islamist offshoots like ISIL, and there are some others, um, then would they be satisfied if they gain victory where they are, or do they want to go further? I don't think there's any question they want to go further. Um, the very fact that the Islamic State first called themselves the Islamic State of, of Iraq and Syria, or Iraq and the Levant, means they, they, meant they expected to take over all of Mesopotamia. There's a pretty good sense that they would, if they could, they would go down and take over the holy sites. Um, it is true that more militant Islamic advocates also are working to to uh, to bring like Sharia law to places in now. It doesn't mean all of them are in favor of that, but I recently was at a conference in Oxford and Cambridge, and Baroness Caroline Cox, who you may have heard of, she's one of the foremost humanitarians in the world today, she's in the House of Lords. Um, she they had to postpone her talk because she had to get back to London because a bill had been proposed in the House of Lords that, like so many bills in all countries, in the U.S. this is the case, you know, there's the main bill and then they attach writers to it, which may have nothing at all to do with the main bill. Well, a bill had been introduced and in some of the fine print and the writers, it was going to move toward advocacy of Sharia law <laughs> that in a way that really wasn't appropriate, okay? Sharia law is a redundancy, by the way. It's you know, it's like saying, uh, well, Sharia means the law, um, and so she had to go back to vote against that, and it get, did get defeated. But she commented on the fact that that sort of thing comes up fairly regularly in Britain, where they really have to pay attention because there's an effort to impose Islamic beliefs and systems again by a minority, by a radical minority, on the larger population, and they're trying. They need to keep pay attention to make sure that doesn't happen. So yes, there are people who are working for that, um, but that's always been the case. You know, it is much a throwback to what I was talking about when I started, and that is that the idea of conquest was a way of life for up until the end of the 19th century, and for them it still is. How can we continue to conquer, continue to expand? Um, I've often said that if I had my way, I might be inclined to rape and pillage. You know, I don't know. Um, I, I, I'm limited by our, uh, you know, our culture and law and everything else, but uh, that is human nature. Much of this is driven by human nature, and it's our human nature too, but we simply have better structure. We have better controls on that. And those who give in to those, those less honorable, less noble motivations, we see the result of that, whether they're Islamic or Christian or you know, whatever. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it. Thanks for all the, all the attention.